Welcome back. We're going to spend the next couple of segments here talking about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is obviously a giant topic. We could spend an entire semester talking about it. Uh, in a survey class, of course, we have to figure out what to include and then what to, uh, what to leave out. Uh, context, I think the Industrial Revolution is its own context. It's, it's so big. Um, uh, I feel foolish trying to place it in, a, in an even bigger context in human history, although you could if you tried, I suppose. Um, let me start it by doing this. Uh, take a look at this map here of the Roman Empire at its height uh, 2,000 years ago. Uh, let's say you're at, the, uh, at Hadrian's Wall uh, between England and Scotland. Look in the far northwest corner. Let's say you're there and you want to journey uh, to the capital of the empire at Rome on the Italian peninsula. Uh, how long would it take you to get there? 2,000 years ago. Uh, well, you'd have to make your way to the Thames. Um, so you'd have to have a horse or a cart or you walk. And once you get to London, you could get a boat. Uh, you could get in the Thames and then sail out to the English Channel. Uh, if you survive the English Channel and make it to France, then you would again have to either walk or get a horse or a cart and make your way across France. I guess you could go overland uh, uh, over the Alps, uh, down into the Italian peninsula to Rome, or maybe you could go to uh, Marseille uh, and get a boat and then sail through the Mediterranean to Rome. At any rate, it's going to take a long time. Um, it's probably going to take a few months if bandits don't get you or the weather doesn't kill you. Now, flash forward, and you can look at the map here of uh, Europe uh, 1,800 years later under, uh, under the rule of Napoleon. Now, take a look at this and think about it. Let's say you're at the border of Scotland and England again, and you want to make your way to Rome. How long would it take? 1,800 years have passed. How long would it take you? Well, you'd still have to get a, a, a horse or a cart, or you'd have to walk. You'd have to make your way to London and then out to the, uh, uh, the English Channel and then across the Channel to France. You'd have to do the same thing. Uh, it would take you the same amount of time. Uh, nothing has changed. Uh, think about it today. You could go to Hartsfield-Jackson Airport here in Atlanta, and you could buy a ticket and be in Beijing, China, uh, tomorrow. Uh, this Industrial Revolution is going <clears> to... <throat> dramatically shrink the world, make globalization possible. Uh, it's going to uh, dramatically change communications and distance between places. It's going to link the world up uh, in a way that had never been possible before. So with that sort of brief overview, let's look at, uh, let's look at some of the significances. And I could go I could probably go on and on and on with significances. Um, I've got a few here. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is going to trigger economic changes. These economic changes change the, uh, the material life of human beings. As a result, there are going to be political ideologies uh, emerging uh, to deal with these changes that have taken place because of the Industrial Revolution. Um, second significance. Uh, predominantly agrarian or rural societies are going to become increasingly industrialized societies. We're going to have endless inventions in manufacturing and transportation and in the military arts and uh, the chemical plants and construction and communication. This is going to revolutionize the world and again make it, uh, uh, make it smaller. Uh, we're going to move from handcrafted goods to mass production. Uh, we're going to create a division of labor within factories and on the assembly lines. And indeed, assembly lines are uh, a distinct characteristic of the Industrial Revolution. Because of mass production on these assembly lines, the cost of things are going to decline. We can make them cheaper and quicker in factories, as opposed to individual artisans trying to make something on their own. Uh, for the first time, you have millions of workers with money in their pocket. And what do people do when they have money in their pocket? Well, as you well know, they, uh, they look for something to spend it on. So we have the birth of consumer society. If you don't believe me, just look at all the uh, gadgets and junk you drag around with you every day, uh, from your car to your house to your personal belongings. Uh, we're going to have a demographic shift from rural to urban. 
and the uh, rapid rise of cities. So those are some of the big significances of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, let's talk about origins and let's talk about sort of pre-industrial uh, revolution here for a moment. Uh, most historians point to uh, Great Britain in the latter part of the 1700s, late 18th century, as the place where the Industrial Revolution really kicks off. Uh, and it kicks off with textiles. Um, uh, and we'll talk more about that. Before uh, this takeoff, uh, you have sort of craft or artisan technology that, that dominates the economic landscape. You have simple hand tools, you have simple machines. Uh, individual skills uh, are important, not the assembly line, uh, interchangeable parts, but uh, individuals who have skills. Uh, production takes place in a shop or, or in the home, not in a factory. Uh, artisans who have developed skills with woodworking or with glass or with uh, rug making or, or whatever it might be are highly valued. Uh, this will change as we move forward because these things will be produced more cheaply and more quickly uh, in a factory as opposed to an uh, individual. And I mentioned textiles, uh, uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in England, cotton uh, arriving in England uh, from Egypt, from the antebellum south here in the United States, uh, from India, uh, this cotton is sent to these textile mills, uh, powered often by uh, water wheels, uh, and then later coal, uh, and we're gonna turn this cotton into clothes and, and, and sell it back uh, to consumers worldwide. Uh, the capital that's required for this industrial revolution, the, the financing of uh, factories and uh, inventions. Well, there, there are a couple of sources here. Uh, slavery is a major source of capital in the early industrial revolution because it is slaves who are uh, harvesting the commodity crops, uh, which is making Europe uh, rich and uh, making possible this dramatic shift in how we produce things. And of course, with, with slavery and with commodity crops, you have a rising merchant class uh, to handle uh, both slaves and commodities, and you have a banking class that's gonna rise here along with them. Um, some of the key innovations in the Industrial Revolution, I'm just gonna mention a few here. Iron production, uh, this makes the construction of much larger uh, buildings uh, possible. Uh, you have a steam engine, this is gonna dramatically change transportation and how we take uh, both people and uh, goods, cotton for instance, uh, from one place to the other. Uh, we can go upriver uh, against the current uh, with a steam engine. Uh, textile production, I've already mentioned, uh, this lies right at the heart of uh, the origins of the Industrial Revolution. And then of course you have precision machine work. Uh, we can manufacture or create uh, construction materials and, and other things. Uh, in a way that uh, was never possible before with one skilled individual creating something as opposed to uh, precision machines creating many of these things and doing it very quickly. I'm going to mention the key innovators, or at least a few of them, just to give you some sense of uh, some of these inventions and, uh, and the people who were responsible for them. Of course, Samuel Slater was a key figure in the early textile mills. And of course, Slater used child labor uh, in the mills. Uh, you'll later see this in the United States, uh, child labor in textile mills. And of course, you have the progressives who complain about this and say these children don't belong in a textile mill, they belong in school. Uh, but of course, it's uh, advantageous for both the family and the mill manager to have children on the floor of the cotton mill. Uh, the family, of course, is very poor, and that child can earn another 50 cents a week, and we need that 50 cents. Uh, the cotton mill manager, of course, can use the children uh, because they can climb those machines. They can reach their little hands in and uh, unjam a gear that may have uh, a cloth or something stuck in it. This way, we can keep the machinery running, keep production high. Of course, we have Benjamin Franklin. We all know uh, one of our founding fathers, who was quite the inventor. Uh, the Franklin stove, for instance, was quite common in colonial America. And Franklin, of course, uh, invented the lightning rod. 
Uh, we have Robert Fulton's Steamboat. Again, it's, it's hard to overestimate the impact of this, uh, where we can move against currents and we can move, uh, we can move large amount of goods rapidly uh, from place to place. You have Elias Howe's sewing machine. You've all seen these. They may be anachronistic to, in today's household. Uh, Cyrus McCormick's Reaper. Uh, how do we harvest uh, uh, grain, wheat, and, uh, and so on in large quantities quickly? And of course, you have Samuel Colt's revolver. Uh, some of you probably have uh, one of these, or at least a, a descendant of the old Colt revolver. And of course, you have Samuel B. Morris uh, and the invention of the telegraph, allowing for communications. So that's, that's a good introduction to this. Uh, when we get back, I want to look at the Industrial Revolution in the countryside and in the city and a little closer. Uh, a little closer point of view, and we're going to look at uh, the Industrial Revolution in politics a little bit as well. Uh, so we'll pick that up next time.